Good morning, everybody. Thanks for thanks for joining us this morning or um, this evening, wherever you may be in the world. Um, this is kind of a unique seminar, and and we're excited to to have you guys join us. I'm here with uh, Colin Campbell and Chris Chambers, and my name is Lauren Crawford. Hi. Morning. So. I want to say thank you as well to the folks that are sharing their data sets um, with us today and the one, with the ones we're going to talk about. We get requests every day to help interpret data, and I'm fairly certain that this is one of the, our favorite parts of our jobs. That being said, if we can empower you to better understand your data, uh, we're going to try to, to do that in addition to talking to you. So that, that's kind of the, the reasons that we're doing this today. Sorry. Anytime we do things live, you know, we'll get something. So I'm pretty certain that the best person to discuss a soil moisture data set is the person collecting the data because you know so much more about what's going on with the sites. That being said, it's, it never hurts to have a third party kind of give you an opinion on what's going on with the data. And in our case, we kind of bring some unique expertise and experience to the table, and, and that's kind of what we're hoping to share with you today. So Colin and Chambers and I can sit around and talk about uh, soil moisture data all day, and we're certainly happy to do that, but this is a pretty informal seminar, and we really want you guys to participate. So. Please speak up, please join the conversation, tell us when you think we're wrong, uh, speak up when you have a question, use the chat feature. If that's not clear how to do that, um, maybe you could use the raise your hand feature and we'll try to address that at the same time that we're giving this presentation. But please use the chat feature and, and we'll, we're going to answer these questions and bring in your comments as we're talking. We're not going to wait until the end. So one of the things that we're doing today, we're going to be asking poll questions such as this one up here. This question is particular um, to help us gauge where we should linger in the presentation and where areas that we might want to skip over. So. A poll question is going to pop up, um, and we we really want you guys to to give us your feedback here, so we know we know who we're talking to today. So we'll just take a a couple of seconds to give you guys a chance to answer this poll question. Thanks. So just to give you guys an idea of who's watching with us today, we've got the majority of the people are, are doing irrigation um, with, with soil moisture sensors. And, and then we've got some forestry and rangeland, a little bit of nursery and greenhouse, some people who are doing other work with soil moisture sensors. And we're certainly curious to figure out what that other work is. So. We'll get started and we'll try to linger around that field irrigation work a little more since that's the majority of the audience. Okay. So this is this is our first data set today. I'm gonna ask Colin to talk about this one a little bit since he out of the three of us is the most familiar with this data set. So th these data were collected actually several years ago now by a couple of, of our good friends down in, in Florida. They're working in orange groves in a really sandy situation. 97% sand is, is quite a unique, um, a unique soil type that we work with, uh, especially down there in that, that Florida area. Uh, the, we had precipitation as well as irrigation in this area, both of which we were measuring 
and we added in the meteorological data to our data set just to, to kind of learn a little bit more about what was going on. The sensors they were using were EC5s and they tried to bury these down in the root zone. And here are the data they, they collected. So we have sensors at 15, 30, 45, and 90 centimeters. Uh, and those are the, th the sensors we're going to focus on uh, just during our discussion. We have some rain coming in as well as irrigation events. And one of the things that, that we're looking at in, in this particular data set is some, some very fast movement of water down through the soil. It's quite an interesting data set because you can see that that immediately on, on a rain event or an irrigation event, we we see almost all sensors responding. In fact, when we were, I was down looking at this site, uh, they were actually using using some of this some of the area of this orchard to to apply wastewater uh, treated wastewater and dumping it directly on the sand, and it disappeared almost instantly. Uh, from view into the sand, so it's not surprising that we'd see this water just if it got on the, at the top sensor that it would be moving down uh, through the uh, through the profile. So one of the things that we're going to want to do here is try to figure out where is our our field capacity point and and then our permanent wilting point in in this uh, in the sand. We're, when Lauren put together this presentation, she went and, and accessed a, a site that, that we really like. It was put together by uh, WSU and, and USDA, uh, Washington State University uh, Biological Systems Engineering Department and, and uh, the USDA. And what they have here is a, is a way that you can try to look up your soil type and, and from models that they put into this program, estimate your field capacity and your permanent wilting point. And it's interesting, we'll show on the graph now as we go forward, we estimate uh, a field capacity at kind of full point, uh, somewhere around uh, 10 to 12% volumetric water content, uh, permanent wilting point around 4%. And then we estimated, it based on some rules of thumb that we, we have, that somewhere about halfway in between is, is our, is our re refill point. We also looked at, at these data over time to try to try to get guess at that information and we've marked up the graph here to to show that now because it's a a sandy soil some of our rules of thumb don't work very well for example we like the idea of, of making measurements of water content about one to two days after applying a, a heavy soaking event uh, either a rain or irrigation and then say from there that's about our, our field capacity point uh, in the sand, with it moving so quickly down through, we had to make some some little adjustments to that. I think we're taking about one day here to say, well, that's kind of our full point. That's that beyond which we're we're really washing water down through the profile. And were you hoping? Remind me. I feel like that with this data set, they were hoping to flush some stuff through the profile. Is that right? So so with the so with that that wastewater treatment and and they were using reclaimed water out out here on the site as i recall and it's been been a few years this was uh, almost 10 years ago but the the uh the, but they were trying to do that um in in some place and i believe here they they were trying to make sure they didn't get salt buildup up in the in the upper profile uh from any any impurities in that water So the, the one of the things we get asked a lot uh, by by people who write you know email us is hey how can I tell if there's water moving past uh, my root zone water that, that really isn't accessible by the plant so we've circled that a little bit what you're seeing there if you look at the at the 90 centimeter sensor that's in red and what you're seeing there is is increases in water content. Now, according to, to the soil physics of the situation, we'd want to be measuring maybe with a lysimeter, uh, certainly with water potential sensors if we weren't doing with a lysimeter to get an idea of, of deep drainage. But the fact that we see water content change uh, so rapidly uh, and over such a wide range down there, 90 centimeters, means that we can be fairly confident that the water that's moving down through the profile is getting below the root zone, and I think we were it, we were uh, 
at least our, our guess was that at 90 centimeters, most of the water that was going to be taken up by the plant was, um, w would be above that. So it, we have there uh, a, a line there at 4% volumetric water content. That was the estimate of permanent wilting point by that Saxton um, program. Yeah, program. we could go back and look at that just to... There we go. So yeah, so if you look there, the wilting point was about 4.4%. Um, that line I drew on there actually was before I looked at the Saxon model again. This was was something that, that Larry Parsons and VJ said to me, hey, this is that 4% line is, is what we've always assumed to be permanent wilting points. So interesting, the kind of conventional wisdom matched up fairly well with with what what they had what what uh, Saxon put together. That stress point is something that, that we never want to get to. Uh, it, it exists on our graph there just to give us an idea of, of where, if we're approaching that point, we're, we're going to be stressing our, our uh, citrus beyond what, what we'd like to. And to, to add to that a little bit, <clears throat> in talking to Galen Campbell about this, he says that it's uh, the Saxton and Rawls model and other models out there do a really good job of estimating permanent wilting point and with that field capacity that's a little bit harder to use a model to estimate because of of the effects of, of density and other uh, or organic matter other parameters in the soil that are more difficult to incorporate in the models so having those two used in in conjunction this is the I, I feel like the oops, sorry I feel like models like this are a great place to start when you're starting to look at the data and then once you're in actually collecting data trying to pick those points using the real data is, is usually pretty effective did we want to say anything about this one or let's let's move on uh, I mean that thing for reiterating some points to me okay great so we've got two additional data sets from citrus irrigation monitoring that we're going to look at today. Um, in this case, the grower is using soil moisture sensors below the root zone to help them determine whether or not they're overwatering. So in the case we just looked at, they wanted to push a little bit of that water below the root zone because it was reclaimed water. And in this case, they're using a sensor below the root zone to help them see how well they're doing with their irrigation strategy. So they're using the full and refill points, but they're refining those with that deep sensor. And these data sets are from an irrigation consultant in Florida who spends his days helping citrus and other growers schedule irrigation. So thanks for Kyle Kirkner with Water and Earth Sciences for sending these along. So I I love this data set and because it's just so nice and it illustrates the point so well how well you can do irrigation uh, once, you, once you start to mentally learn the, the soil moisture and what the values mean. So let's just talk through this value. I don't know if you could see my mouse on, on here, but this, this blue line here is the soil moisture sensor in the root zone and they're actually using this sensor to trigger an irrigation event so you can see right when the sensor gets below this target zone an irrigation event shown here in the green comes on and this this line down here this darker blue line this is a sensor that was placed further below the root zone so any water going down here is water that's lost for use by the plant. And you can see they're doing an incredible job of keeping their water in the root zone where the plant can use it. And it's only these times where they have a precip event, so these uh, blue bars are precipitation events compared to the irrigation events. Those are the only time where they get flow through the, the root zone down down below and that that's a really interesting uh, point for me to see that so uh, anytime you're you're doing really precise irrigation like this you do have to be aware of salts building up in the soil in this case where they're monitoring precip and 
and the irrigation and monitoring below they're able to see that when when they are getting a buildup of salts it is it is getting pushed down during these irrigation events Lauren do you know how they're triggering irrigation on this one are they using a I don't uh, that that's a great question for for Kyle and I don't know that I didn't have a chance to ask him but I I wondered the same thing mm -hmm. So this is a, another data set that Water and Earth Sciences sent over, and, and this is a case where the goal was to decrease the amount of time that the irrigation pump was on. And Kyle did a great job of, of showing here how many minutes the pump was on and the changes they made over time. So again, they used that sensor below the root zone to help them gauge how much water they were keeping in the root zone. So you can see here, the pump is on for 534 minutes. They they get a little spike below the root zone, so they keep dialing that back a little, and the, that spike in the root zone continues to go down until finally down here, at a, they've cut the time that the pump was on in over half, and that they're not getting any spikes down there below the root zone which to me suggests that they, they're keeping the majority of their irrigation water in the root zone for the plants to use, and they're, they're minimizing the amount of time that that pump is on. Now we have a data set from Spain where a drip irrigation system is used to irrigate a corn crop. So the reason we brought in this, these drip irrigation data sets is because they really create some unique challenges for using soil moisture sensors to interpret uh, your irrigation and to manage your irrigation. When you have a, a homogenous front of water coming through like you would with a, a flood irrigation, it, you, you, you have a little more flexibility on where you put the sensors. And so if you have three sensors at 10 centimeters depth in a flood irrigated regime, you can, you have a really good chance of, of those sensors reading similar to each other. When you have a drip system, the, the response of the sensors is going to be really dependent upon where they are with respect to the that bulb of water under the dripper. And so we're going to see in here a little bit how the location spatially uh, with regards to depth plays a really important role in interpreting the data. So the, this data set we're going to look at a total of nine sensors. They have three different profiles in this system and each in each of those profiles we have a sensor at 15, 30, and 45 degree or 45 centimeters. So right here we're looking at the data um, di displayed where all the sensors at the same depth are graphed together. So the next slide we'll look at is is where the sensors in the same profile are together. But what I wanted to show here was this effect of uh, we get calls a lot essentially saying, look, my sensors are installed at the same depth and they're reading differently, so the sensor must be broken. And a lot of times, really all that is is spatial variability. So at the, at the fifth, if we just look at this top graph here, we can see one of the sensors, the sensor in blue, has some major spikes where the other two don't. The other two might just be in a different location uh, to, to, with respect to the dripper. Alternatively, the dripper that was above this blue profile might have been malfunctioning, giving these weird spikes. We don't know, but what this is meant to convey is that you really need to understand where your sensors are with respect to this dripper to interpret the data. And th but the, the other point is that we can also learn a lot more from having these sensors spatially located with respect to where the dripper is. 
Okay, and now we, we regrouped those same data sets to look at the profile, the individual profiles, and you can see they make a little more sense where you have a spike at the 15 centimeters and then down to the 30 and then down to the 45 and that that's what we'd expect. It looks like also we had a sensor up here in the the blue profile that looks like it got unplugged at some point and maybe got plugged back in. That we often have questions about hey, I don't I th I don't know if my sensor's working or not. And this is a really great example to show look the sensors if it's not working, it's really not working, typically. It doesn't typically look like real data when the sensor is working properly. So that's one thing to keep in mind. If it looks at all like real data, the sensor's probably working fine. Have you talked about the, uh, about the kind of orangish line there? What, what's that all about? These or are the orangish shade? Yep, so these, um, these oranges, this is from uh, the consultant our consultant in Spain, Lab Ferrer, they also do irrigation consulting and they're also our, our rep in Spain. And what they provide to their growers is a, a target zone. That's what you're seeing with that ar orange. A target zone that they recommend the grower keep their soil moisture sensor, uh, the, the data from their soil moisture sensor in to, to have the optimum irrigation so that you're not having you're not wasting water if that's the goal, and you're optimizing growth. So and essentially, this was something similar to we t when we talked about the right. citrus that they actually put just the shade in there to show you show where they're trying to hit kind of the full and refill points. Right. Yep. And so they were they, and I haven't I haven't worked with Lab Ferrer with this group in particular, but typically they'll provide these, and then the grower depending on what their strategy is. They, they try to stay in that target range or they don't. Sometimes, sometimes they make a decision that is better for them to get out of that target range and that might be what we're seeing here early on in, in 2014. So if you've watched any of the seminars that I've done, there's a good chance that you've seen the data that we'll be presenting next before. This is a data set that I collected with uh, permission from the vineyard, of course, and, and so I feel like I have a good understanding of what's going on because I put the sensors in there. I, I looked at it on a weekly basis to try to understand what was going on. And so from a data perspective, I feel like I know this one pretty well. Um, this vineyard in particular does deficit irrigation which is a really good segue when we, we've been talking about having a target zone with a full and refill point. With this data set, they're actually cha they'll change their target points uh, over the span of the growing season to account for that deficit irrigation. So after bloom is complete, they, they go from 100% of apotranspiration demand to 80%. So that was how they schedule irrigation the first year. I was just wanting to learn about vineyard irrigation. They were just willing to let me come in and play. So this first year, they didn't look at the data at all, and we would just discuss it uh, when, when both they and I had time to go down and talk about it. And because I didn't know anything about vineyard irrigation and they hadn't used soil moisture sensors, we were both learning what the data meant for the first time. So unlike the the last data sets where we saw where these are well-trained consultants, we were, we were new to the game with vineyard irrigation. And so I'll probably spend a little more time with this data set, again, because it's mine and, and I know more about it. But let me tell you a little bit about what we're looking at here. So this blue line is your water content value at two feet and this purple line is your water content value at four feet. These black and green lines are your water potential at those same depths respectively. So the black is water potential at four feet, the green is water potential at two feet. But so what is that in SI? <laughs> 60 and 120 centimeters maybe? What's that? 
you're, you're giving it in uh, English units. Uh, oh, sorry. So, so 60 and 120. I don't 60 and 120. Right, uh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to make sure. <laughs> I did present this in Spain, and so I did had done all the conversions, but in my head. It's still it's well, still to, in feet. to the vineyard here in the U.S. They, they're they're going to talk about it in feet. So yeah. just to make sure everybody knows what we're talking about, about 60 and 120 centimeters down down buried in the soil. And we were trying to target the areas where the roots were. We have a this is a really thick layer of silt loam soil. You can see the cover crop underneath here. This is cocoa umica in this picture. They they make great wines. Okay, so back to this data set. This is a long time ago. This is 2009, and we're still collecting data from, from this site today. But let's talk about early on. So we'll just talk about the water content here at the 60 and 120 centimeters, or 2 and 4 feet, whatever units you feel like you want to use. Um, what, what Carl Umiker's goal was was to, uh, like I said, irrigate at 100% evaporative demand until bloom was complete which happened right about here where you could see these drop-offs and then he he just went to 80 percent and so what I thought was really interesting when I called Carl the first time I said hey Carl what what happened here I thought you were a deficit irrigating after the 4th of July but you've got these huge spikes that actually went above field capacity. What's going on there? And he said, oh, well, well, I didn't mean to do that. I was just trying to get water down to four feet. And so this is a really great illustration of when having these sensors can give you an idea of what was going on. It was hotter these days. We talked about why he was trying to get water down, why he deviated from that 80% ET. It, he said, look, it was, it was hotter that day. I just wanted to ensure that the plants didn't get too stressed more than I wanted them to so I applied a little more water and so like I said his goal was to get down to four feet he never got down to four feet if you look at this purple line we see these spikes at two feet we never had any water hit that four foot sensor this is something I see all the time in particular customers will call in and I, I poured water on and poured water on and but I just can't get it down to the sensor. That sensor can't be working. Um, as particularly on hot days with a high uh, transpiration um, and unsaturated soils, you know, you can it takes a lot of water to to get past that root zone in particular and, and hit your deeper sensors. And it may not happen. I mean, we, we in a silvone soil uh, like we have here locally, you know, during during a hot summer, uh, once you lose that water down down deeper in the profile from roots down there, what what what's happening is is um, the, the is that that water gets taken up there. The, 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 there's no the hydraulic conductivity just is not going to be there compared to exactly what you're saying. Especially the evaporative demand uh, is right. not there. It is is there? So so the water's coming out, and and so if you're expecting be able to replace that water down though you got to start bef be before uh, the, the deficit becomes so high that you're just not going to be able to to balance that that's right and bear in mind that water is going to move laterally too so uh, it's basically <laughs> going to be pulling it left right uh, and left right and up yeah so you might be applying it there and it's running off and, yeah, yeah and it's yeah. just don't have the don't have the ability to move it through All right, let's see. All right, I want to talk a little more about this <clears throat> about this data set. Again, remember that Carl didn't look at the data the first year. He was using a standard ET method, and that's what we wanted. That's what everybody wanted because no one knew what the data was, was going to tell us. So I think in February or so, Carl and I got together again and looked at what had happened over the winter and and what was shocking to Carl, who's the, the viticulturalist, was that these stress levels up here, the water potential levels at these deep zones continued to, to increase. They, the water became less and less available 
through December, and that got him a little bit, that was a little frustrating to him because he did not want his vines going into winter under that stress. Are those MPS twos, Lauren? Or these MPS are MPS ones. ones. These okay. were these predated MPS twos. By the way, we had a question on that first year's data set before we jump into the second, which just said, "Hey, why can we see the spikes on on those particular days, and where are the sensors installed mm. with respect to the tree?" Uh, and you can answer this, maybe, Lauren. But my guess is that that uh, I mean, they're they're down at uh, at sixty centimeters. So any any nominal irrigation is just going to kind of be all lost kind of in the smoothing of that curve. But Carl there, as I understand it, was actually hitting the irrigation really hard to try to get water back in. And so you're gonna see the spikes because he really poured on a lot of water during those days. That's right. So again, like Colin said, because of these depths being the way they were, if we had had a sensor at one foot, you probably would see more of the, the spikes in the irrigation. I think these were so deep that you just didn't see, he did, and he was irrigating once a week during this uh, during 2009 and we never saw it when he was keeping at 80 percent et we did <clears throat> we did see it when he was um when he over irrigated over that 80 percent Sorry, yeah, sorry to interrupt. So we uh, yeah, keep the questions coming. Yeah, We're exactly. happy to stop and yeah. uh, address things as we as they come up. Thank you, thank you for that question. So, so you were actually talking about the second year though, where we were we were starting to see the a, a flattening out of that water potential trend. Mm -hmm. um, now, now one thing, by the way, as you're talking about that, it, one thing to mention is the the actual water potential we're seeing there, which is during you know starting mid. To early to mid July, we're seeing a, a negative 200 to 250 kPa water potential for those grapes. Now, my under can you talk a little bit about that? So, so typically, the plant optimal is around, you know, if you're below about negative 100 kPa, you you the the plants are feeling a little stressed. Why would we expect to see this in a vineyard uh, at about negative 250? That because they're trying to stress the grapevines, right? They are, and, and this is another point with where the, where the sensor is with respect to the dripper. Where these water potential sensors are, I tried to get these near where the, where the dripper was, but this might not, what the root sees is not necessarily what the sensor is seeing. That's our hope, but it's not always the case. But yeah, in this case, they were, you could see down here when they weren't, trying to stress the plant, they were at about uh, about field capacity, neg negative 33 down here. And it was only when they were st intentionally stressing the plant, and that's the choice of a, a grower, that not everybody does this. It's very, it's difficult and it's risky. And so not, not everybody does this. This is a smaller vineyard. So in once a week, do you, do we, how much, do you know how many liters they were putting on during that time? Oh, I don't, I don't remember. I. Uh, I know he would irrigate. I can't remember the emitter rates. I know he would irrigate for about 24 hours once a week during and 2009. Maybe that's something we can post after the seminar mm -hmm. uh, just to, to give a little feedback. Uh, so a great question. Uh, we'll probably we'll try to get that. that I information think it was. I, I don't know. Maybe it was four liters an hour. Okay. But but he would irrigate his this first year. He would irrigate a lot of. Uh, 24 hours and he he was using other things he was out there with the the vines all the time and so he just hadn't incorporated this into his his regime for scheduling irrigation I just want to point out another thing here with this you could see this water content finally started to recover in December but the the water and the water potential that that forefoot took a really long time to recover. This is all just recovery from, from precipitation. They, when they stopped irrigating, when they harvested, um, the only recovery was from irrigation. Or, I'm sorry, precipitation. Okay, so after that first year when Carl and I both learned a little more about it, we decided to put some additional sensors in to to install 
or to, to just look and see that we had the question before about, well, we never saw irrigation events with those deeper sensors. So we put one at uh, 30 centimeters to see if, if we could start seeing what was going on. And now that Carl understood better what he was seeing, he, he was invested in learning more about it. So what, one of the questions that, that, that came up here is, is, so we see some of the water potential and the water content, the mm. sensors kind of doing their thing here in the, in the graph. Um, how to decide which one to use? Well, it really depends on, on the approach that, that uh, we're trying to take in the field. What, what I would say, um, I love, to, and, and in my experiments right now, I'm doing this, I love to co-locate water content and water potential sensors because with the water content, you can get a lot more detail, especially uh, when, the, when, the, when we have a high amount of water in the soil. As that starts to decrease, we get that fine tuning that, that's given by the water potential sensor. In this case, if we're really trying to deficit irrigate and trying to hit, you know, that negative 200 to 300 kPa range, of course, that your, your sensor you're going to depend on is going to be the, the water potential sensor. And yet, you know, the water potential can change so quickly, especially something like a sand where you're doing great. Uh, you have plenty, the water potential is high, nothing's changing, and suddenly, boom, changes so quickly because of this, this, the water release curve suddenly you, you drop. So I, I love both. Yeah, water potential really gives you a great, a great measure of what the plant is actually experiencing and what it's dealing with. But I think a lot of people, it, it, water content is such an intuitive measure, I think a lot of people just have an easier time understanding that measurement and wrapping their head around what it is, what it means. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, no, that's really true. And this is, this is a case where since we're when, since we manufacture these, and I had a little playtime, I could install both and see what happened. And uh, someone commented that it, it is really interesting to see these sensors co-located and, and, and watch what the data are doing. Let me get this. So I think the main point was that, that uh, the challenge is, of course, that many matrix potential sensors can't read below a certain water mm -hmm. water potential. So if we were reaching the negative 150, negative 200 kPa, a lot of things are dropping out, and that's absolutely mm -hmm. true. My favorite favorite water potential sensor for accuracy is the tensiometer, and of course that's gonna run out at negative 80 to 100 mm -hmm. kPa, and so we really couldn't see the stress condition. Um, the the MPS-6 that, that I'm working out in the field with right now does a good job, uh, well below permanent wilting point, so I'm, you know, we're happy about that, but the downside is that it doesn't work between zero and negative nine kPa. So in a, a really well watered situation, we may not be able to see any anything here. So well, for any given soil too, there's a relationship between water potential and right and water content. So if if you understand your system well, uh, it's whatever you're more comfortable dealing with or whatever you can in, you have the funds to install. Um, the trick, the real trick, and this is in every irrigation application is understanding uh, how your plants are responding to what's there, whether you get water content or water potential. Uh, wh what does your level need to be to turn the water on and when do you need to turn it off, right? I would say I agree with you partially, but I think this, this data set is a perfect case to show um, when water potential is better used. So I love to have both in deficit irrigation examples because when we have when we're at field capacity, even with a tensiometer, there's just not a lot changing with water potential at that high of mm. water potential. It's hard to get changes. It's hard to uh, see changes and interpret the changes. We were looking at those citrus data sets where you saw really fast changes, and, and that's around field capacity of water content. But you can see down here, once we start, start deficit irrigating, you don't get huge changes in water content, but you're getting giant changes in water potential, and that's because of that relationship. That's a great point, Lauren. Okay, uh, let's see what's what's next. No, maybe I'll let you look at those too. So again, we Carl was excited about the data. I was excited about the data. We installed more for the next year, and Carl started looking at the data more frequently. And and this is a data set from 
the following year. This is a really confusing data set and, and someone made the point that I didn't put a legend on the graph and that's a good point. I totally forgot. You know, you get into these data sets and you start to know them and, that you, and then you forget that no one else knows them as well as you do. So once, uh, the point with this one essentially is that we put a sensor at one foot. Let's, we're just going to be looking at water potential here. We put a water potential sensor at, at one foot or 30 centimeters and, and had another one at two, two feet and four feet. Again, so 60 centimeters and 120 centimeters. And I got busy this year. Carl was happy. And then I'd check in every once in a while and look at the data and I'd call and say, what's going on? You're irrigating so much. How, you're doing a lot more than once a week. And this is a great case where the grower started to learn what the, the data meant for um, he He's at the vineyard. He's seeing what the vines look like every day. And what he recognized was that if he could keep that one foot sensor uh, pretty wet, that he could maintain, these squiggly lines are kind of difficult to see in this, but these are those two foot and four foot water potential lines, these, these two purple lines. And what he realized is if he irrigated more frequently but with less water, he could keep the, the stress levels of where his great, the grapevine's roots were, the, the stress level very consistent, and that, that's what he did here. Another thing to notice is after, after they harvested, he did a, a major irrigation event here to kind of bring his roots back to, to field capacity to get ready to go into the winter. So Carl was really happy with, granted there's a lot that goes into to grapes and Carl just did a great presentation about all of the things that make a good good grape and this was just one of I think his top 10 list but what he called me with at the end of the season with and said he was really happy about was his his levels his his sugar levels had gotten to where they were they were just kind of sitting around waiting for everything to to get even better with the grapes whereas the year before they'd had extra growth uh, they'd had extra vine growth because of those he thought because of those spikes in the year where he didn't intend to give so much water, but but he did. So there are a couple of questions, and then we probably ought to move on to the WSU data set. Later. Okay. The so a question on measurement interval: How or often were you reading out here? Do you remember? Mm, probably every hour. And so one of the comments, another comment was related to water potential and water content, and that, that people have a little more experience with the the water content so are we going to see kind of the stepwise drops in water potential across the day like a water content and one of the reasons I say well I love both in this situation is because water content really tells you how much water is being used in the crop and when you're an irrigation specialist one of the big pieces you have to offer is tell people how much you've got to water you know replace during a day or during a week and that's why a lot of the reports are going out to the growers that, that they're actually saying so and water potential doesn't say that it says how you know how close you are to the line but but a lot of people want to put up those those shaded regions and say stay in here and then watch the amount of water uh, changing so so that's a great question and and water potential is great it acts like a, ha a thermometer in your house telling you what range the plants are happy in kind of like how happy you are with the temperature in your house but they're not going to tell you how long to turn on your heater uh, to, to heat your house up to be more comfortable again. You can't tell you how long to turn on your sprinkler with water potential uh, you can with water content. Another point was made that actually is a really good one. We do see a little more lag in the water potential uh, measurement uh, in, in compared to the water content. Certainly in, that, in the first graph we were looking at, that's not typical and, and that really may be a part of what the the soil was doing you saw in the in the wet up can you go back up to that graph really quick well there is also an equilibrium process at work there right that's yeah, uh, exactly so it's that I mean that's a function of the sensor a function of the sensor and a function of the soil yeah uh, whereas the water content sensors get an in instantaneous it's like your flat like a flash photo right where the water potential is kind of more of an integrated measure uh, that requires equilibration of the sensor with the soil. 
Yeah, no, that that that's exactly right. And I don't, you know, I don't know in this graph where we got the green line coming down, that's the water potential. The blue line on the bottom coming up, that's the water content. And obviously the water content jumps up, you know, I mean, we're talking a full month uh, really before the water, the water content jumps up compared to the water potential. That's not a sensor related thing. And this is, uh, this is also maybe just, this was a drip system. So right. if the sensors are five inches apart from each other, you well, but, see but the, well, but this, this, I mean, this case, we're talking the winter though. This, oh, was, yeah. this was just, yeah, yeah. just oh, yeah, precipitation yeah, yeah. recharge. So, so, you know, I would say that you're exactly right, Chris, it's a, a function of soil more than it's a function of sensor. But, but what would you expect for a water potential and water content sensor response? Water content instantaneous, water potential probably one, one hour in the wet situation to, you know, five or six hours if you were coming you know, if you were very dry and, 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 and stuff like that, so. Okay, we're actually gonna skip to to another data set. We're gonna skip around a little because Colin has a class to teach. Yeah. Well, we talked about this pretty extensively. Let's talk about this turf one real quick. Okay, so we were, so uh, last year, um, a couple of friends of mine were working in, a, in, in turf grass and over a weekend, the Memorial Day weekend, holiday weekend here in the U.S., some, something went wrong with their irrigation system and it shut down and killed all a very important uh, grass that uh, was all dead. They said, hey, we don't want this to happen again. Hey, can we work together with you to, to do and I was all excited. It's always fun to go in a new environment. I hadn't worked in turf grass before. We installed sensors at 6 and 12 centimeters. That was the co-located water content sensor and the new MPS6 sensor we just came out with. And uh, so that was at six and at 12 centimeters and down at, at uh, sorry, at 15. Uh, and then 25 centimeters, so we put a water content sensor that was well below the root zone um, of this grass. And we just wanted to see, well, what, basically wanted to make sure there was still water coming into the system at all times. And then beyond that, what is the behavior of water in the turf grass system? So just to take you through this data set quickly, um, you can see all the labels down there. The water potential from basically from mid-June all the way through uh, the end of September really did almost nothing. So the, the, the lowest we reached was actually when they shut off the system for a couple of days. We approached negative 50 kPa. Uh, you can see the water content changes. And basically, I, I suggested to them after looking at those purple and blue graphs and saying, hey, we're going up and down quite nicely, but we never touch the water potential. We never get to the point where uh, there's stress. And again, we're in, we're in a pretty sandy situation. Said we're washing a lot of water below the root zone. That's not a goal. So let's see if we can back off a little. So that's what we tried starting in August. <clears throat> you can see the irrigation pattern changed uh, to... Uh, <clears throat> a less frequent irrigation with a, a midday application to try to keep the the uh, the plants from going into stress. Still, we didn't have any any water potential stress in the in the uh, root zone uh, of the the plant, and we're still getting water uh, moving through down at that 25 centimeter level. And just kind of to to round out the discussion, we're still trying to figure out how to play with this better, even when we slowed down. More on the irrigation uh, between August and September, you can see those water content spikes delaying uh, out to more like four or five days. Still, we didn't, nothing changed in terms of water potential. And finally, when we shut the system off in, in October, um, you can see then we started to, to apply some stress, which is actually what you're trying to do in turf grass. Um, and, and we have a, a great data set. Uh, in that sand, things are jumping up and down, kind of like we would, uh, would suspect, but you can see from discussion of the vineyards that we've got a lot of work to do to try to improve how we water the grass, how we, uh, how we limit the water, and that kind of light blue line showing a lot of spikes, water moving beyond the root zone. Uh, we've got to figure out how to limit that. So that's, that's a little bit about, about that. Well, Colin's got to get to class. Thanks for joining yeah. us. It looks like we're about halfway through with about five minutes left. So we're probably gonna have a part two of this at one point, but so that we can get out of the irrigation a little, I'm gonna skip around to a, another data set here to, to close us out. So you'll see a lot of stuff if you're interested in the stuff that I'm skipping through. 
and join us for the for the next iteration of this. This was another data set at Cook Farm. We love this data set, but we're going to skip over this. <laughs> well, I but like that one. It has a big point. I that love a lot of miss. that data set. All right. We'll see if we Part two. We, we'll see if we could get a non agriculture application and I do want to ask people this though because I am really interested in this um, we talked a lot about this water potential uh, water content comparison and I really want to know from you guys what if you have a preference and I know that all that not all the time you'll have the ability to choose in a lot of applications you need water content and in a lot of applications you need water potential but in scenarios where you have the choice I'd love to know what what you get to what you choose again with me I always choose both I have that advantage I guess <laughs> and we did have someone apologize for too many questions do not apologize for that uh, I think it uh, really helped us get a discussion going a little bit better and hopefully made it a more interesting presentation. And uh, I think we'll maybe try this again in the future. And by the way, we did overload this presentation with data, <laughs> so uh, it's uh, totally fine. No, we, we enjoy it, so please keep asking questions. We're, we're ha if, if you work for a company that makes soil moisture sensors, you're always going to have too much data. <laughs> Okay, let's move down here to another data set. Okay, this, I, I talked to, to James Leary about this data set yesterday for, no, I guess it was two days now, for over an hour, and this is actually a site that I've, I've visited, and it's, it's, really beautiful. So aside from Hawaii being beautiful, th this these data sets that James has collected are just phenomenal. So what we're going to look at are these and assault, these sites where he's uh, James manages invasive plant species on, on Maui and uh, the Kikuyu grass there is an invasive species but it also outcompetes a a more destructive invasive species called fireweed. And so kikuyu grass may be able to be managed by adjusting stocking rates and grazing intensity of, uh, of the grazing animals, which can then manage fireweed without herbicides. And so the reason that James is monitoring soil moisture and temperature is to try to better understand kikuyu pr productivity so that he can guide ranchers towards a more sustainable towards more sustainable grazing practices. Give me just a second here. Okay, we're going to move down to talk about the site a little bit. So we're going to look at uh, four of James's nine weather station sites. We're going to be looking at the top pair, which has the most substantial difference in elevation between the two sites, and essentially what this gives us is a, an incredible temperature gradient in between the sites. So they, they have approximately the same precipitation regime, but vastly different temperatures. And then we're going to look at this middle pair a little closer to, to kind of look at what a, uh, th these are large longer term data sets and this is going to show us what a drought in a natural system might look like for the soil moisture in an area which we just thought was really interesting so again these are andesols in the in the lower elevations and so these are volcanic soils and they don't have a lot of structure and the higher elevation site is a hydric soil so it's essentially staying staying saturated all the time Okay, so this this is James's data set from the the two pairs that we talked about. This lower this lower soil moisture line here is that lower elevation site, and the higher one is from the higher elevation. And what James told me about this, and if I misrepresent this, this is this is all me. <laughs> this is not at all James. I w I was typing feverishly to try to capture everything that he said, but. 
it's still really fun to look at and to talk about it, even if I get it wrong. So I, w I was really curious as to why these were t so different. There's about double the water content in these two soils. And James said at this higher elevation site, the temperature is really what's controlling productivity so that there's not a lot of, uh, there's not as much growth and so there's a lot more water in the soil. And what James really likes about these data sets is that he can use these, uh, to, he says these are more useful for him to help him understand the timing of precip events than a tipping bucket. He said specific, specifically at these higher elevation sites, the, there's a lot of fog contribution to, to the water coming into the system and the, the tipping buckets just don't capture that really well. And what he's started to be able to do is look at an event within the hour and he can essentially estimate from how large that event is in the soil moisture data he can estimate how many days he's going to have water available for plant growth. And he wanted me to point out here where, and we'll see this more, uh, more distinctly in the next data set that we look at, that when this soil moisture flat lines here, he said this is absolutely real. Once he gets about a little below this 20% value, productivity just shuts down. Okay, we're, we have a couple of questions here that we're gonna we're gonna address. So one question was, what's the and this was for the previous work. What's the difference between water potential and matrix potential? Matrix potential is a component of the soil water potential, which is made up of gravimetric, matrix, and osmotic. Osmotic, yeah. So yeah, so you'll have a, a water potential. We we kind of use the term we a do. little bit interchangeably. We do. Um, and the uh, we the kind NPS of assume a minimum osmotic and a minimum gravimetric. And the uh, matrix potential sensor, our NPS sensors do measure matrix potential. Okay, so we're going to go to another data set here. And this, this is such a fun illustration of well, it was not fun at the time. I'm sure it was very stressful to be going through this drought. Um, but you could see this drought of 2012 down here and you can see the soil moisture starting to recover in 2013 and 2014 and James said this was strongly, as you would expect, strongly reflected in the productivity. One of the things he said was most interesting, again I would said we'd see this more here, we see these, you get these spikes in water content when there's a uh, precip event, again these are unstructured soil so you see it very almost immediately and then you've got this nice exponential decay down to a flat line and he said nothing is going this is real data nothing is going on at this flat line that there's no more available water and he he's using these exponential decay curves essentially to to help him forecast into the future how many days of productivity you'll have. And that's one of the ways he's using this to help these ranchers uh, schedule when they bring any of their grazing animals up to, to graze. So we're a little past nine o'clock um, and that's the, that's the end of our time. As you could see through <laughs> Through all of these other data sets, we have a lot that we still want to talk about, and we'd love to do a follow-up if you guys enjoyed today's seminar. We'd love to, to do this again and talk about those other data sets. Um, if, you, if you have any questions, um, please, you could email us after at support at Decagon, or you, like we said, you could just type them in here. Again, we'd love to do this again. Um, again, I wanted to thank the people that were willing to share their data sets with us today and, and to talk me through some of the conditions at their site. As you could imagine, when you're looking at someone else's data, we had a lot of questions today that, I, that we just hadn't asked people and it was, it, it, it's very telling when, when you don't have all of the additional information with the soil. 
And one more note, um, a couple, we've had a couple people ask it, uh, if they could send in their data and get our opinion on it, and uh, we're always happy to check out people's data to see what they're doing, particularly if there's some unknown or, or if you're not quite sure what's going on in it. Uh, we don't have all of the answers. Um, all the data sets today we've had, had time to mull over and get some more information about. Um, but we're happy to help out as much as we can and uh, at, at least try to help you come up with the right questions to move forward. Um, and you can send those. Uh, feel free to send any data sets to support at decagon.com. And I really enjoyed this today. So if you're willing to let us get up and talk about your data um, in front of a couple hundred people, please please tell that to, please tell that to us in your email certainly it doesn't uh, there's people that we talked to and they said no I, I don't want you to share my data please you can certainly still ask us about your data and we're more than happy to to go through it with you um, but we also love sharing data if you're willing to to share the data with us so again thanks for joining us today have a great day and we hope to hear from you guys soon